Hello, this is Pamela Smythe. I'm one of the hosts of Beyond the Bulletin, the podcast of internal communications at the University of Waterloo. We bring you news and views from the U Waterloo community. Please spread the word that we're on soundcloud.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now the interview from episode 89 of Beyond the Bulletin. There has been a surge in cases of discrimination and violence against people of Asian descent in North America since COVID-19 began to spread beyond China. This week, the U.S. House of Representatives voted overwhelmingly in support of legislation aimed at expediting a review of pandemic-related hate crimes. But anti-Asian racism didn't start with COVID-19. Kim Wen is a scholar of Vietnamese descent and a professor of communication arts. Her research interests include the relationship between ethnicity and race and living in a society guided by white supremacy. Here's our conversation. Kim, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Pamela. According to the Government of Canada, Asian Heritage Month is an opportunity for all Canadians to learn more about the many achievements and contributions of Canadians of Asian descent. But when I first heard that, I thought Asia is enormous and diverse. There are at least 20 religions across the continent, more than 600 languages in Indonesia alone, 850 in India in regular use. With that in mind, what are your feelings about something called Asian Heritage Month? I'm mindful of the fact that Asian heritage is something that should be celebrated and incorporated every day, not just in one month. But I'm also aware that Asian stories, experiences, and cultures often go in the background of white supremacy. And because of that, it's necessary to remember the histories of Asian struggle within white supremacy and in North America that often get marginalized. So for me, Asian Heritage Month is not a month to remind ourselves as Asians that we need to learn how to cook, you know, our favorite Vietnamese or Chinese foods, right? Or to speak our mother tongue, for example, those things are very important um, and we should know and celebrate our culture. But for me, Asian Heritage Month is a reminder to think about Asian struggle against white supremacy and to remember, for example, our ancestors who fought for redress from Japanese internment, our ancestors who fought for recognition about discrimination of the uh, from the Chinese head tax. So remembering these struggles and how they align with the struggles of other marginalized peoples is how I understand and celebrate Asian Heritage Month. So st- aligning with other groups, not just focusing on the spotlight on Asian history in Canada necessarily? And recognizing that our struggle, that Asian struggles are not individual, right, Um, or in isolation from other kinds of struggles, that other marginalized peoples are experiencing similar things or things that perhaps are in greater magnitude than what Asian folks within white supremacy are experiencing. Why is it important to look at other groups' experiences? So for me, this is important because white supremacy, as I understand it and how I explore it in my classes, is about the institutions, the ideologies and values that create and promote white domination. So this includes the institution of slavery. This includes settler colonialism and colonialism in general, right? And so when you recognize Asian struggle within white supremacy and in relation to all of these other struggles, and you see that white supremacy has incredibly harmful effects on all people of color. I think that it would be important to delineate what we mean by anti-Asian hatred and racism and that anti-Asian racism should also include Islamophobia, right, which bears, and and I, I think that this is important to mention because you know, the Quebec ban on face coverings from 2017 is also a form of anti-Asian, anti-Black racism, right? Mm. And that in general, when we're talking about anti-Asian racism, right, the lines around that are 
rather unstable, right? And that many of the particulars of anti-Asian racism are often what many immigrants of color, people of color experience, even if they don't have Asian descent. And so I, I think that that's important to sort of delineate, as well as the fact that the emergence of this term that we're hearing quite often, especially after COVID-19 and in the pandemic, is perhaps maybe in reference more to xenophobia, right? And anti-Chinese or anti-East Asian sentiment. And so it it, it doesn't just in, include, say, what's going on in relationship to anti-Chinese sentiment, right? Is sort of what I'm trying to highlight there. Recently, there was a, a bombing um, or a shooting at a Sikh temple, Right. And that is um, an event that is also demonstrative of anti Asian sentiment, but wasn't necessarily incorporated into discussions around anti Asian sentiment, right? Because it, it, people thought of it as be, belonging to sort of an anti religious conversation. Right. Now, you're American. You were born in the United States, correct? Yes. The former president of the United States used to refer to coronavirus as the China virus. He infamously crossed out the word corona and wrote in in a script and replaced it with the word China. It has to have an effect, right, on people. Absolutely. Yes. And calling it the China virus or the China flu has really reinforced and bolstered anti-Asian racism and xenophobia reinforces the idea that dirt, filth, sickness is associated with race, which is an idea that goes as far back as when Asians arrived to North America. There is an old playground rhyme, um, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees, look at these. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I remember growing up and experiencing my white peers saying that and teasing me and and doing the slanty eye motions along with it. Oh. Um, Yes. So the idea was that Asians, or at the time they were once called Orientals, were seen as unclean, that they brought disease and sickness with them. And that is part of the ambivalence that is shown in the kinds of laws around North American immigration that both allow for Asian immigration, but also restrict their numbers, right? Or have other Mm -hmm. kinds of restrictions around who is an acceptable Asian for entry. And you also see this kind of viewing of Asians as unclean when folks make negative references to Chinatown as unclean or sketchy um, or Asian foods as dirty or making them sick, right? This association between dirt and race, between filth and Asianness is an old strain of racism that allowed for a lot of misinformation about Wuhan to spread and go viral. And this happened before with SARS, and it's important that very similar things happened as well when Ebola broke out in Africa, where the association of dirt and blackness was reignited as well. You know, the tensions between Asian countries and Canada are only being exacerbated by, right, what what's happening in the United States, right? So, for example, at the start of the Trump presidency, there was a lot of nervousness about North Korea and Kim Jong-un mm-hmm. and what United States was going to do. And that would have a lot of implications to Canada because we're an ally. And I don't know if you remember this, but at one point, it spiraled to the point where China's ambassador explicitly named Canada as white supremacist, right? So the tensions that are going on between these countries, between governments, Mm -hmm. are being mirrored to a certain extent with the people within them. Oh, yeah. Your parents arrived in North America as refugees from Vietnam. What a long a long, hard road it was for your parents to get to North America. It was about an almost year, 10-month journey. How has that shaped your life and your impressions of racism in North America? 
My very first research project was looking at the largest Vietnamese American protest in South in, in the United States, which was in Southern California. That research project was about how these Vietnamese Americans were engaging in conservative anti-communist politics at the cost of sort of seeing themselves as a uni- unified racialized people. Mm. And what they were doing was trying to delineate a good Vietnamese person versus a bad Vietnamese person. A a good Vietnamese person was someone who was anti-communist and a bad Vietnamese person was a communist. And this kind of distinction was also an ethnic distinction that was being created during the French and American wars with Vietnam. And I was really inspired to sort of pursue this kind of research because I was being mindful of my own heritage and, and being mindful of the fact that my, my parents were Vietnamese refugees and they see themselves as sort of gracious subjects of anti-communism uh, and thankful of Western empire. And then while I was in university, I was a producer of a hip hop radio talk show and I had an interview I was going to be doing an interview with Yuri Kochiyama who was a Japanese internment camp victim um, and uh, became famous as Malcolm X's best friend who Mm. ran to the stage when he was shot and assassinated and when I talked with her she really oriented me to the kind of politics and the kind of research that I have been doing today, which is trying to locate moments in which racial solidarity is possible or is being ignored, right? And as a communication scholar, I try to focus on disputes over language in which that racial solidarity might occur or should have occurred. So this week, the U.S. House uh, passed legislation that states that anti-racist complaints to authorities during the pandemic should be fast-tracked and that there should be ways to report online and also have some outreach. So all 62 nays were Republicans. One of them said, you can't legislate away hate. What do you think about the fact that this is actually now at the point where it's waiting, just waiting for Joe Biden's signature and then it'll be law? I think that there are many concerns that are being vocalized by some Asian groups, not necessarily the Asian groups that are behind much of this legislation and the senators and and Congress people who are behind this legislation. And those particular groups are concerned about how this makes racism a crime, right? And as a result of that, it means increased surveillance of communities of color in which Mm -hmm. that can really hurt rather than provide uh, attention and redress of the actual racist uh, causes. And, And so I do believe that there needs to be some kind of way of addressing the fact that increased surveillance is not the answer to dealing with the kind of racism that Asians are experiencing right now. I think speaking as a Canadian, I think we could be pretty smug. It does get to be a bit much because we like to cling to reports that we're so kind and polite. That is an example of white supremacy in the sense that it's harder to address whiteness and its features and its effects in Canada because of the fact that we couch it in niceness and we couch it in this idea that it's not as violent or not as explicit. And as a result of that, there's an utter refusal to acknowledge that racism even exists in Canada. So looking at reports of anti-Asian hate crimes in 2020, I looked at this list. Uh, Los Angeles was fifth. Toronto was fourth. Uh, New York came third, which was surprising to me. Montreal is second. And the highest number of reports in 2020 of anti-Asian hate crimes in major North American cities is Vancouver. You sent me this article, I think, that that said that. Were you surprised to read that? I was not surprised by those numbers at all. You know, I think that it's important to note that 
the Asian American Pacific Islander population is the fastest growing population in 2021. This is a statistic for the United States, but you have in general, right, laws and an utter disregard, right, of anti-Asian racism and acknowledgement that Asians are racialized people in um, in society, right? So, for example, this means that when you when you see people talk about the foreign property tax, it means that mm. people believe that it is justified because. Asian people are stigmatized as taking more than what they need, right? As being wealthy people who are just parking money in real estate, when in fact, foreign buyers account for a very small percentage. And in in the case of Vancouver, it's less than 1%. Or take, for example, you know, even here at the University of Waterloo, right? We have a very high Asian student population. But there's very little acknowledgement of that fact. In 2019, there were uh, there are about 25 universities that offer Asian majors. Um, that's it, um, and this suggests a disregard to Asian identity and ways of knowing in the world. And I think that Asian students really long for understanding of themselves as racialized people. I think. Broadly speaking, part of the problem is that, in general, folks often take a binary approach to race and colonialism, right? That is, they look at race as a black-white issue, right? Or they look at colonialism as an indigenous settler issue, which really flattens the categories of people, and it really mutes out the complexity and nuance of our history, right? When Asians have been in North America since you know, 17th or 18th century, I think that they are an overlooked racialized group because Asians are often mythologized as the model minority, which is the idea that Asians exceed at all levels, right? At Mm. academics, economically, as Asians, they're quiet, good minorities that affirm the idea that power structures really work for the marginalized. You talk about the importance of language in your work. So help me understand how important language is when you're dealing with racism, anti-racism, what effect it can have. So I think that language reflects the assumptions that are embedded in our culture and that when we communicate certain words, certain tropes, certain values in our language that we are endorsing those values. We're endorsing that sentiment. And at the same time, I believe that when we change our language to be more inclusive, to be more equitable, that we're also trying to imagine a better world. And so when I tell students that it's important to embrace, say, politically correct language, I'm urging them to do so with the the mindset that a more equitable world, a different world is within reach. And part of what allows that to happen is having language that helps us do that imagining, language that helps us articulate what that world of equity would be like. And so I think language is very important to making the first step in making change and at the same time maintaining that change so that further progress can be made. Any other points that you want to share on the topic? To a certain extent, it took a mass murder for there to be attention to xenophobia as really being harmful and deadly to society, even though it has really mushroomed since the pandemic. And we do see outright violence toward Asians in Toronto and Vancouver, but it's also probably all over Canada. It's just not being reported. And so I think that that's important to also bear in mind as well. Kim Wen, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and your ideas today. I really appreciate the conversation. 
Thank you, Pamela, so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this interview from Beyond the Bulletin. To listen to all of episode 89, look for the Beyond the Bulletin podcast on soundcloud.com. Don't forget to tell your Waterloo colleagues and friends about us. Thanks for going Beyond the Bulletin with me.